So I think Marta originally asked me to come to this meeting to talk about, well, um, to talk about this. Um, since she's not here, and I won't be here for the symposium, the talk is going to be a little more pedantic, or sort of information filled than generally these talks have been, to put it on record so that she can, can follow up if people have any questions. So it feels a little technical. Um, that's because it is dust, cool gas, and solar pollution <laughs> in a mixture created in six uh, supermassive uh, black hole host galaxies. Um, it's going to be about 25 minutes. Uh, so we can interrupt, um, and then we got a discussion. And speaking of discussion, I thought I'd start the way Kevin did, which is just put up the questions that I found the most uh, compelling when I first thought about coming to this meeting, right? Some of which I'll discuss a little bit today, and some of which we've discussed already. Origin and sigma relation, uh, how does it evolve? And I'll come to that later. And is that actually real? I'd like to in fact, get a handle on whether it's really a trend or not. Uh, I've been looking at the review article by Clemente and Cole, and it's a little convoluted. Um, how do you form these massive black, supermassive black holes so early in the universe? I still find that a very, uh, a, a very puzzling uh, issue. Uh, we see them, but how, how do they get there? They do get there. I'll talk quite a bit about early cluedal formation of massive galaxies, massive black holes, and how does that process occur? Um, and I will mention the early formation of dust in the universe. Uh, it came up, <coughs> somebody mentioned that you brought up that question. How do you form so much dust so early? Uh, it's not true. Um, it's not really germane to this particular meeting, but if people are interested, I will bring it up. So to, uh, if, oh wow, that's big. Um, <laughs> it's going to be even bigger than this uh, But that's good. Uh, great detail here. You know, this is not really a radio audience, so I thought it was important on one slide to introduce what we learned about galaxy formation from radio observations. And I show here a spectrum flux density versus frequency of a typical star forming galaxy, uh, you know, from one gigahertz up to one terahertz. With the sent it's a redshift five, it's redshift to the five hundred solar masses per year. With the sensitivity of the modern interferometers DLA in the line in the continuum in the line sensitivity of ALMA and precursors here. Just a couple of important points to keep in mind. What do you learn from centimeter to submillimeter wavelengths? Centimeter regime, it reveals the molecular, the classic millimeter molecular transition CO1. Low water CO emission, which gives you total gas mass, gas dynamics. The dense gas tracers tell you something about gas immediately involved in star formation, and we'll talk about that very much. Uh, synchrotron emission, AGN star formation, uh, AGM or star formation all over both. And then you make it the free free emission at around 100 gigahertz rest range, which uh, is a direct indicator, estimator of star formation. It hasn't been verified yet, but it is a potentially very interesting uh, technique. So centimeter telescopes import for studying classical millimeter ones, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, the OA playing a very important role here. You move out to the millimeter, submillimeter, you get the high order molecular line transitions, gas excitation. Uh, Dust emission, obviously, this inverse K correction, really gene side of the dust emit the emissivity curve, uh, which gives you a star formation indicator. And then out of the submillimeter, you start picking up the atomic fine structure lines. Uh, these things far enough for a line to shift to the submillimeter region. I'll come back to that at the end in some detail. I think that's one of the most exciting things that's going on in studies of galaxy formation, because it gives the fine structure lines. So there's information across the spectrum, and I'll go into that throughout the talk. Another important thing here is to point out the incredible improvement in the submillimeter in terms of sensitivity. Uh, as you'll see, it's almost as if uh, we've never looked at the sky at these frequencies. Um, so uh, massive galaxy formation, supermassive black hole formation, average redshift is about six or so. Uh, and the idea of quasar host galaxies within 12 years. Now, why do we study quasars? And the answer historically was strictly practical. Uh, there were increasing samples at the highest redshifts, the ones that we knew most about, some tens of galaxies, quasars now, beyond redshift of six, hundreds beyond redshift of five. They had spectroscopic redshifts. <coughs> for the previous instrumentation, narrow band spectrometers on millimeter telescopes, you needed that in order to do the molecular line spot. You needed a spectroscopic redshift to get the molecular line. Not true anymore with ALMA, we get wide band. VLA has uh, 30 percent fractional bandwidth now. So we can survey a large volume uh, to look for micro 
and that's become a new business. But previously, they had spectroscopic wrenches, and they're very massive systems. Uh, Olometric luminosities, these are Sloan type quasars, 10 to 14 solar luminosities for the quasar, talking about very massive black holes, 10 to the 9, most massive things in the universe here in terms of the black holes, which implies a massive galaxy, and that's the kind of thing that you can see with previous instrumentation. Just want to make one generic point here, uh, and I won't show any slides on this, but it has become pretty clear over the last few years that massive galaxies form most of their stars quickly and early in the universe, and the more massive, the quicker and the earlier. And here we're talking about really the most massive galaxies in the universe, uh, probably, and therefore it's all happening. Is that an uh, is an extrapolation to the present day of uh, large mass? Uh, Which? The m -bulge. This is what, no, no, you have a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole. We can talk about where you get that, but that's not. Uh, how about where do you, where do you get this? Would be, that would be 0.1% uh, of 10 to the 9. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that actually probably wasn't 0.1%. We'll come back to this yeah. exact. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll come back. This is one of the key uh, speculative points of the talk, in fact. So where's our, this will be some of the details now, so the sense of the information, just to get it on record. Our surveys start with 250 gigahertz surveys of the dust continuum emission using barometer cameras, 250 or 350 gigahertz. So that's 0.8 or 1.2 millimeters. Uh, of high redshift quasar samples at redshifts 2, 4, and 6, and hundreds of quasars are now observed. And the interesting point is we detect a, about a third of the quasars at more than 2 millijanskis at 250 gigahertz, basically independent of redshift, redshifts 2, 4, and it continues right out to redshift of six. If you adopt the spectral energy distribution, if you adopt the spectrum, you can turn two Miljanskis into a luminosity, far and free luminosity, and that's these two lines here, two different uh, SEDs. Um, and that demonstrates one thing right, right off the bat, which is something we're probably all very familiar with, is the inverse phase direction. The fact that if you fix your observing frequency and you fix your flux density limit, you get, in fact, a fixed luminosity. So we have a, a distance-independent way of studying objects in the universe because you're coming up the religion side of the dust curve. And that's a very powerful technique. It's like absorption, but that. Uh, and now that we're going much faster than two millijanskis, we're starting to study relatively long galaxies in this way. So you can see these things at, at, at any redshift. The important point is the one-third fraction which is right out to redshift of six. The infrared luminosities implied are of order 10 to the 13. Uh, solar luminosity, so these are hyperluminous infrared galaxies. Implied dust masses <coughs> order a few times 10 to the 8 solar masses, just for numbers of the record. Which leads to the first interesting question. Sorry, I can see that we have some issue with it. Oh. Sorry. Sure. First interesting issue is how do you form so much dust so early? Uh, and I showed here some work by Dorowski. These are some of the high rate, the redshift six quasars, this is redshift. You find dust yield per star for if you form it, uh, it starts using the standard mechanism of cool wind and normal stars, a nice way here. In fact, these are the limits that you would essentially get. Can we, can we test it here? Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello. It works. Half the dust destruction, that's the light will hear then. Oh no, that's the dark will hear then you can do it with super. If you don't, if you, uh, uh, only if you don't allow dust to be destroyed at the same time as created. Um, then supernovae can do it. Uh, it has led to a whole army of papers on AGM-related dust formation, uh, none of which I find particularly convincing, but uh, certainly, you know, this is what happens. But whatever, there, there, there's, there's models out there. There is some evidence that the extinction curves are different. The 2000 angstrom uh, bump and the extinction curve doesn't exist at high redshift. It indicates bumps. Oh. Sure. That's right. That's fine. A different kind of dust at high redshift, which was what you might expect. Anyway, we see the dust, um, and then you ask the question, how is the dust heated? Now, the far infrared luminosity is only about 10% of the quasar luminosity. 
So plausibly, the AGN could just heat the dust as well. We think it's star formation. I'll show you a couple of, of, of reasons why we think that. Here's one of the reasons is the study of the spectrum. This is uh, rest frame UV right out through the radio for a redshift 6.4 quasar. Uh, this is not necessarily the best example. I will show mostly best examples. But this is pretty typical. We have this for all the sources we've looked at, where in the rest frame UV through uh, mid IR, you get the hot dust corresponding to the AGN uh, dust around an AGN 1,000 Kelvin. But out in the far infrared, you see a peak above the standard SED of a lower redshift quasar. We think this is star formation dust at about 50 Kelvin. If you extrapolate that into the radio, you find it follows the far radio far infrared correlation for star forming galaxies. Uh, in which case we're talking about star formation at the rate of about 1,000 solar masses per year in these systems, meaning <coughs> a hyperluminous infrared galaxy, coeval starburst plus AGN at uh, when the universe was less than a billion years old. Okay, if it is star formation, you have to fuel the star formation, and so we go out and look for molecular gas. These do remain uh, not quite, still the highest redshift in CO detections to date. Um, with the exception of one submillimeter galaxy. Uh, in every case we look at, we detect CO, and I show just a few examples here. I want to make a couple of points. First of all, systematically detecting very faint lines with the plateau de Burr interferometer and the VLA below one millijansky is, is pretty typical. Uh, and yet these uh, interferometers can do that. And you get the 3D, you get a spectrum and you get an image, which is a very nice diagnostic for reality. To give you some numbers, uh, the implied gas masses are of order 10 to the 10, a few 10 to the 10 solar masses, modulo some sort of conversion factor from CO to H2 mass. I'm adopting the, the, the uh, starburst value uh, for reasons that I'll come to, uh, but we can talk about that if you like. Um, line widths of order a few hundred kilometers a second. So one thing you can start doing once you have uh, once you have a CO detect, gas detection, you can start doing interstellar medium physics out at redshifts of six, which is quite a uh, quite an interesting prospect, in fact. Uh, and I'll show you some of the things that we have been doing. You can study gas excitation here. This is normalized flux or flux density for a fixed velocity uh, velocity width versus rotational quantum number for CO one to zero, two to one, four to three, etc. Milky Way in a plot like this, this is normalized to, at, at some, at, at, the Milky Way luminosity is way down, but that was normalized to the 3 to 2 line. On a plot like this, the Milky Way peaks at about the CO 3 to 2 transition, and then rolls off due to low gas density and lower temperatures. These systems show very high excitation, continuing essentially new squared constant brightness temperature right up to CO 6 to 5, so very high gas excitation, similar to what you see, let's say, in the nucleus of ARP 220. Right. What does that mean? <laughs> well, standard radiative transfer modeling tells you it's got to be warm gas, about 50 Kelvin or greater. And more importantly, it's got to be dense. The average density has got to be a few times 10 to the 10, uh, which is an interesting number because even if you look at a GMC, a giant molecular cloud on tens of parsec scales, the average density is still about an order of magnitude or two below this. Okay, so this is really dense gas. You only see gas at this density when you get to the star-forming cores of giant molecular clouds on parsec scales. So the entire ISM in these systems looks like a star-forming core of a GMC. And that's pretty radical, in fact. Uh, can't get away without showing a star formation law plot. This is the standard far infrared to CO luminosity correlation. Uh, low redshift spiral galaxies down here. Ultraluminous infrared galaxies here. And then some of the high redshift sources, quasars and uh, and uh, some millimeter galaxies up there for the most part. The black stars are the redshift six quasars with some small correction for possibly an AGN contribution to the dust heating. Generally, the whole thing follows a given uh, correlation, nonlinear correlation, parallel index of 1.5. The fact that the quasars fall generally within the scatter is further circumstantial <coughs> evidence that we're dealing with star formation and not AGN heating of the dust. But again, that's strictly circumstantial. Uh, if you do interpret it as star formation, 
the one thing you do find is that the gas consumption time scales for these very high luminosity sources, the hyperluminous galaxies, 10 to the 13 in the far infrared, the gas consumption time scales, which is the gas mass over star formation rate, decreases uh, down to less than 10 to the 7 years. So they burn up their gas very quickly in these, in these extreme starbursts. Another nice thing you can do with gas is, is dynamical imaging. Uh, and here's, this is uh, probably our best uh, example in CO at Redshift 6. This is VLA imaging of the CO3 to 2 line, uh, which is a fairly high order transition coming down to a centimeter wavelengths, which is cool because you're up at such high redshift. CO3 to 2 emission from the uh, Redshift 6.42 quasar host galaxy, it shows a large cloud, about six kiloparsecs across galaxy type scales. I should point out, these CO observations are the only direct probe of the host galaxies as opposed to the AGN phenomenon for these first quasars. Right now, everything else is just looking at the AGN on some scales that is very small. We're actually getting galaxy scales. Hard to do in the optical because of the bright quasar uh, or the near infrared. Um, down in the center of this at 0.15 arc second resolution, we see two high brightness temperature regions 25 Kelvin brightness temperature, so they're sort of going optically thick, uh, contain about half the mass of the system, but again, this big distributed gas distribution. Uh, velocity shows a clear gradient. If you interpret that as rotation, and you make some, some wa wag at the, uh, at the inclination angle, you get a dynamical mass of about six times 10 to the 10 within a few kiloparsec radius. So this gets back to your question. Um, that, you know, it, it, well, I'll, next slide I'll clarify this a little bit more. But potentially weighing galaxies out at these high stretches. Um, and we're getting dynamical masses of order 5 to 10 times 10 to the 10 solar masses within 3 to 5 kiloparsec radii. The gas mass to dynamical mass ratio um, is about 30%, which means that they're becoming baryon dominated in these regions. And there's not a whole lot of. Uh, space to argue for a much <coughs> higher conversion factor, a Milky Way type conversion factor for the gas mass. But you can do this for a bunch of sources, and you come back to the discussion we had yesterday about this M sigma relationship. Um, and here it is at redshift, uh, well, two to six. Uh, here's the black hole mass versus velocity dispersion. The low red redshift relation here is the open, uh, the, the, the circles. Uh, that you know implies a linear relationship between the black hole and the bulge mass. High redshift sources are shown as the squares and the diamonds. Now, there's a lot of caveats that go on go on here. Um, how do you drive the black hole mass? And in this case, they use the magnesium two line width, or simple Ed Eddington arguments. In either case, you get something that's good, probably to a factor of a few, maybe an order of magnitude, but probably a factor. Let's hope a factor of two. Uh, the bulge mass comes from the CO line width, the CO imaging essentially, size and, and, and velocity width. Different ways you can convert that to a sigma as opposed to, let's say, a rotating disk, hence the open and filled squares. But regardless, generally, the black hole, the high redshift sources form what was called yesterday a plume to high black hole mass above the relationship. In other words, they are systematically more massive than you would have expected based on the low redshift relationship. Now, yesterday, the plot we saw, the theoretical plot we saw was down in this regime. Now we're up here, but whatever. Yeah? The sigma that you're getting, that is a tracer of all the mass. Gas. That's the, that is the gas, the, the mass for the galaxy inferred from the gas dynamics. You can't get stellar dynamics. Um, you can't get stellar luminosities. But you can get gas dynamics on scales of, of 5 kiloparsecs, 10 kiloparsecs. So thinking a little, a little bit ahead in the evolution of this galaxy, mm -hmm. even if we think that it might catch up and its stellar mass or non-black hole mass increases, where is it going to get more stuff from? It has to accrete, right? It's got to get gas from the, oh, absolutely. In order to get on that. Yes, region. yeah, that's right. It's, it's going to burn this gas up pretty quickly. In order to continue to grow, you have to, you have to get gas from outside. I think that's true even for the Milky Way, actually. There was another hand up. Ah. Uh, yeah, so um, 
I, I think th these are exciting, but um, I guess there's a point on how well do we really know if this gas actually moves in the velocity field that you assume, because you probably assume some sort of geometry, right? Yeah, we assume rotating disks, and then you can convert that to a sigma, the equivalent sigma for a uh, elliptical galaxy. That's a, just a mathematical thing. I mean, mass versus mass would be a simpler thing to plot, but whatever. No, I, I understand. I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just wondering if we can assume that these things are realized and whether we... Right. It could be outflow. Uh, you could have uh, non-gravitational dynamics, hydrodynamics, um, like outflows. You could have um, non-virial dyna gravitational dynamics, like something just falling in or whatever. Sure. Do you have any um, sort of ideas, suggestions to how we can possibly get a better idea? Yeah, you do good imaging. Get so rotation curves. Imaging? Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to that in a, in a few slides. Um, you guys have tons of star formation, right? Oh, yeah. So you should have tons of gas and outflows. So, for example, do you get any correlation between star formation? And velocity width, for instance. Uh, I haven't looked at that, but uh, but most, of the, I mean, the star formation range is pretty small, right? You know, we don't, the range in star formation rates probably a factor of a few. So it's pretty small. So this is, I would say, preliminary work, and I would, that's why I put these caveats up. We really need better CO imaging, uh, but right now it's the only way of getting after this problem at, at, at Redshift Six. So at least we're trying to do something. All of these effects that we just mentioned, they would just move their points to their left. Right? Right. Right. They won't. Yeah, the galaxy would get less mass, yeah. not more. Uh, it would be nice to have a further, a further out in radius, a dynamical trace that goes further out in radius. So let me just pull this part of the talk together um, in, and show one of these simulations as we saw yesterday. But this is for a massive galaxy now from the Di Matteo work, the massive black simulation. I mean, can this actually work? Right, and they claim it can. This is the most massive halo in their very large volume cosmological simulation. This is gas temperature here. And they claim that uh, from a redshift of 15 down to redshift of six or so, uh, you form lots of stars via efficient cold mode accretion. And the star formation rate basically traces the gas accretion rate from the intergalactic medium. Uh, at the same time, you're forming a, black, a supermassive black hole. That's all these green circles here. They claim it starts with a 10 to the 5 solar mass seed and steady Eddington limited accretion with the idea that this will evolve to a very massive cluster in the early universe. So these are the most extreme systems in the universe, and that's, I, that's the one statement I do agree with the rest. Well, that's just a simulation. Uh, <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Their galaxies are factored 10 to too heavy in stars, right? You said something like 10 to the 10. Ours is a few 10 to the 10. About 6, 10, and 10. Oh, but that's stellar mass. You're right. Because most of our mass is, you know, actually, we don't know what the stellar mass is. It could be half star. But we know the dynamical mass. I quoted a dynamical mass. Right. Right. Um, so within the factors of a few, it, it sort of hangs together. But like I said, um, I'm wondering, could, could one make it an upper limit on the, the stellar uh, mass? Because you have star formation rate, and you have something about how long it could have lasted with that gas mass. So there was a maximum. It must be 10 to the 10. Yeah, I mean, you put those two together, you get 10 to the 10. But uh, we, it's really hard to get time on, on Space Telescope to do this. We've tried it quite a few times. They, they just say it's too, it's too hard. Um, well, even a redshift of two, they don't want to give it to us. Yeah. During the black hole, how does this object compare? How do these objects compare to the uh, galaxy that the Japanese team has recently found that they call Kimiko? Kimiko, yes. Uh, These are the star formation properties. These are much uh, larger, higher star formation rates by at least a factor of ten. Yeah, at least a factor of ten, uh, maybe maybe more. Um, so yeah, that was a lower star formation rate galaxy, Lyman Alpha. That was a typical type. Oh, yes, more like an Lyman alpha meter. That's right. Um, although it's kind of fuzzy, which is interesting. Let me just turn the last five, ten minutes, if that's okay, and then we can have more open discussion. 
um, on what we're doing with the carbon two line and, and, and high redshift with Alma. I think this, like I said, is the probably the most interesting thing that's going on uh, in galaxy formation today. And let me just start with an example: uh, redshift 4.7, uh, classic submillimeter galaxy quasar pair, one of the first submillimeter galaxies ever discovered, uh, 1202 minus 0725. It's a quasar, luminous blue quasar, and a optically obscured submillimeter galaxy. Both are detected in dust, hyperluminous infrared galaxies, so uh, extreme starbursts. Both are detected in molecular gas. This is the most recent plateau to burst CO imaging. Uh, here, large gas masses of order 10 to the 11. People look for the important carbon-2, 158 micron gas cooling line with the SMA, the best instrument um, available, at 330 gigahertz. This is 1900 gigahertz rest, and it comes down to the submillimeter here. Uh, and for 20 hours, and they see nothing. Um, Alma looked at this for 20 minutes with uh, 16 antennas, or less than a third of the full array. And we get effectively infinite signal noise detections of both the quasar. As I said, it's as if we have never looked. It's, it's, it's that level of, 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 of advance. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of prospects here for staying the carbon-2 line. So let's just go over what the carbon-2 line uh, is all about. It is the brightest line from cool gas and star-forming galaxies. Uh, here's the far, C2 to far infrared ratio versus far infrared. Uh, for Milky Way type galaxies, there's a scatter, but typically carries about 0.3% of the far infrared luminosity. It traces, it's got a lower ionization potential than hydrogen, so it traces both the cold neutral medium and the warm ionized medium. Uh, that's why it's such a good dynamical tracer. Now, there is a problem is when you get above 10 to the 11 in terms of far infrared and luminosity, you get basically the scatter blows up here. Here's the high redshift galaxies that have been detected today, and there's a couple of more orders of magnitude scatter. So personally, I don't think the C2 luminosity tells you very much about, let's say, star formation rate, but it's so bright that it's a very good dynamical tracer, so you can do gas dynamics, and actually as a redshift determinant. I'm not going to talk about that today, but um, it can be used to find the redshifts of the very first galaxies. Um, although Himiko is not detected in carbon-2, which is very puzzling to me. Uh, so let's talk about gas dynamics a little bit, and what you can do, I come back to the 1202 at redshift 4.7. Here's the continuum emission, the dust continuum in contours. Uh, we detect, again, the submillimeter galaxy and the quasar. The HST image is behind it in color. We detect a third galaxy down here in dust continuum emission. This is a pretty typical Lyman alpha emitting galaxy uh, that's uh, here. There's another Lyman alpha emitting galaxy up here. Um, now, that's the continuum. You're getting to an RMS of 0.1 millijansky, which at the time was the deepest submillimeter image ever made. Uh, not anymore. But uh, again, we detect the submillimeter galaxy, strong carbon-2 emission. The quasar, strong carbon-2 emission. There's a bitty, big, broad line here. We also detect this Lyman alpha emitter down here. It falls at the edge of, edge of our band because we actually didn't know about it before we observed, uh, which is too bad. And we detect this one in the carbon-2 emission as well. In other words, we're not just detecting extreme starburst-type AGN. We're, we're actually relatively easily detecting normal star-forming galaxies. In the early universe. You can look at the gas dynamics, uh, and this is uh, channel maps uh, from plus, minus 500 to plus 500 kilometers a second. You see the big broad line from the submillimeter galaxy. You see the strong narrower line from the quasar. In a couple of velocities, uh, in the center you see what appears to be some type of a tidal feature, a bridge connecting the two going over one of the Lyman alpha emitters. When you get down to the highest velocities, you see what appears to be an outflow, a tidal feature, who knows, from the quasar extending down to this galaxy to the southwest. Uh, you can put it all together in one plot, which is uh, here. I show the Lyman alpha emission in color, and then the C2 emission in that one velocity range that I, I showed, uh, that showed this tidal feature going over the Lyman alpha emitter, really showing all of the indications of a gas-rich merger driving an extreme starburst AGN activity at Redshift 5, the, essentially the smoking gun for, for a, a major gas-rich merger driving these processes. Here's the velocity field, narrow velocity uh, tidal feature, which is not unusual. Beautiful rotation curve for the submillimeter galaxy. That's the kind of thing that we want to do 
in order to, you know, one, once you get this kind of data, well, it's going to be a little better than this, but it will be, then you can really do a proper dynamical analysis of a galaxy mass. You fit tilted ring models. We've done it in one case, a submillimeter galaxy. Since it's not a quasar, I'm not talking about it. Uh, but, you know, I see the velocity gradient. You see what may be an outflow to the south, uh, and then this galaxy down here. What do you mean by alpha escape fraction, given this definition rate? Ah. Uh, uh, star formation rate derived from the Lyman alpha luminosity is a good question. Yeah, both, both. I don't know if we've done that. First of all, you don't detect Lyman alpha from the submillimeter galaxy. It's completely obscured. The quasar is some other phenomenon. It's a broad line region. This galaxy here, you can do that calculation. Um, and I know the number, and I can't remember it. Um, well, that, that's what you asked my question. Uh, sun millimeter is not detected. Yeah, it's totally obscured in the outside. Yeah, there's a lot of dust on these damn things. Um, but yeah, I, I have the answer. That's all in the paper. We go through all those. We try to do some to sort of uh, uh, multi-line analysis to find structural lines, the molecular lines, the Lyman alpha. You can do a cloudy type analysis, and Art Wolf actually did that for us. And, came up with some weird answers, because it's possible that the quasar actually is ionizing the, the field out here and not star formation. Um, that's plausible. Did you about T4? Because it looks as if you, you also said you had some high velocity outflows that were going in that direction, and it's all. And down here, this is looks more like a normal Lyman alpha mini galaxy. Um, it's not at the exact same velocity, but it's within 500 kilometers a second. It looks as if it's, it's totally, so either it's falling in, or I was just wondering if it actually had anything to do with the outcome. With this, no, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's all a bit of a uh, you know, gravitational mess. Um, so we've turned this to the redshift six quasars to get back to the main topic. And Ron Wong had a uh, cycle zero program with, with ALMA. We observed five hi hyperluminous redshift six quasar host galaxies. And we detect all of them in the carbon-2 emission. Here's one example, dust and gas. And here's the uh, velocity field showing, again, very nice velocity gradient, which uh, you get sizes of order a few kiloparsecs. In most cases, you do see this clear velocity gradient, which uh, gives a rough estimate of the dynamical mass on these scales, which is comparable to what the same conclusions we were making based on the CO. Um, I'll make one more point, which is that given the sizes and the star formation rates, the star formation rate per unit area is about 1,000 solar masses per year per square kiloparsec. And that's what uh, Thompson and folks, Krumholtz and the rest, predict to be a maximal starburst disk. It's a self-gravitating gas disk supported by radiation pressure on dust grains. It's basically like an Eddington limit, but for star formation. Um, and that's what you expect. And that's actually what you see in star forming cores in giant molecular clouds. You also see it in this nucleus of ARP-220. Now we're seeing it in hundreds of quasars. One last point, and I'm surprised no one, well, I guess somebody was asking about is feed, uh, feedback, outflows. People are making claims that there is evidence for outflows in some of these spectra. This is the redshift 4.7 quasar showing a high velocity wing here. Uh, in this case, uh, it's only a few, couple hundred, 300 kilometers a second. Um, could be due to star formation, actually. For 6.42 quasar, 1148, uh, Maiolino sees what appears to be a very broad wing, 2,000, 3,000 kilometers a second uh, full width, uh, which would give a mass outflow rate of order 3,000 solar masses, solar masses per year, which can't be driven by star formation. This would have to be an AGN outflow. I do worry about this profile a little bit, but this is what they have, have published. So uh, let me just put up some numbers in summary. Uh, for the record, we have now uh, 12 millimeter continuum detections of dust. Question about dust formation at these very early redshifts. Uh, the SEDs imply very active star formation in these galaxies, hyperluminous starbursts. Uh, we detect all of these, about 11 in CO, large gas masses with uh, very high excitation. So pretty extreme conditions. Uh, very short gas consumption time scales. Uh, departure from the M sigma relation, which would suggest that the black holes form before the their hosts. 
um, and some very nice results on carbon too. So let's, I, I think at this point I would just leave it open to discussion. That's what I wanted to present for the record. Yes. So, further on the M sigma relation, do we have any information when the galaxies get onto the M sigma relation? At what redshift? Mm -hmm. I'm presuming that at that redshift they still haven't settled. So yeah, the there are some redshift two quasars on here too. That's these sources in here. Uh, let's see. Well, 1.4 to 5. Um, I should say, we're not the only people working on this. Uh, I think, what is Joe Shields? Is that him at Ohio? Yes. He's doing this uh, using CO measurements and other things. Um, Okay. So I think there are actually two issues here. Uh, first of all, it's hard to determine the black hole mass, right? Could be off. But also, for even it, when you go to redshift of point 0.4, I think that's the Wu and Tromasso yeah. Trose stuff. Um, they're using stellar absorption lines at that point, and yeah. it's hard to measure the stellar velocity dispersion when you have this strong glare from the quasar. Yeah. Um, so one has to, you know, actually weigh that in there as well. But what I find is interesting is all these CO bandheads measurements that there are, they always seem to put the, 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 the mass of the galaxy a little lower than we'd expect them. So I don't know if it's because of some, something systematic or whether the black hole mass is really higher or it's, I find it curious. Well, yes. So the black hole masses are, as you know, pushing what we see in the local universe, right? So somehow you have to grow the galaxies without around it without actually galaxies. growing the black hole any further. Exactly. <laughs> you can do that by just basically starving it. Just don't send more gas down its way. What's that? You have to find the stars. So you have to grow the galaxy, but not grow the black hole. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually a fussy eater, right? How much actually goes down the throat, right? Well, I thought they were, they ate know. anything. They, they ate little bits of everything. They used to be within the gravitational region. Right? <laughs> sure. The picture that, that, that's emerging here is actually really interesting and puzzling because what we get when, when, when you look at quasars is we see these black holes grow up extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. And they live in what presumably also very massive galaxies. Yeah, highly biased systems. Highly biased. But so we turn it around, we look at the small galaxies that have black holes, they're not growing rapidly and they're not massive. as massive. So it you know, I, I wonder if we're running into the, the, the downsizing trap of saying, Oh look, most massive systems appear to grow really rapidly and then you have this inversion in lower mass systems. And I'm, i it, it, it feels like we're missing something, like a huge chunk of something. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm actually waving my hands in it here. But there, there's, there, there's some mode of growth, maybe, that we're just not picking up. I worry a lot about selection, right, in the sense that the Sloan quasars are just these really weird things, and there's about 100 of them in the universe and that kind of thing. Um, that's my biggest concern is that, you know, you select for extreme objects and, and weird things happen. It would be nice to push this all down by a factor of 10 and see what you, get, what, what you see. What I'd love to see, and it's not clear to me that we probably need very large surveys for that, but mm -hmm. I want to see one of those 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes. A few million years before, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, growing at the end. Well, if you, if you believe these simulations, this is what I asked a couple days ago, but maybe I didn't ask it very clearly, so why don't I ask it again in, 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 my, in an opaque way, is if you took one of these simulations, the, the idea is that in order to get here, which is already pretty extreme, uh, I think the claim it's got to be very steady Eddington limit accretion. It could be super Eddington for a short time, but assuming that that doesn't occur, then it's got to just keep going the whole time. So that means I get redshift seven and a half, 
there should still be things that are really bloody bright. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That these things are bright and they should be findable. And redshift eight, it'd be a little fainter, but it still might be 10 to seven or 10 to 7.5 solar masses accreting Eddington, and you know it gives you hope to see something. So let me let me uh, rephrase the question slightly. Given the data we have right now with goods and cosmos and so forth, and the fact that we even found these systems, should we be surprised, or are these things so rare that we shouldn't worry? Uh, either Sloan is a, is a, does most of the sky, don't they? So that is one big advantage. Cosmos does two square degrees, but goes n times deeper. Um, is that n big enough to go up the luminosity function enough? Well, yeah, uh, to, to see these, because these are all probably on the exponential part. You know. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's probably easy enough to find. <laughs> Is the star formation that's happening here? You showed a plot of you know star formation rate versus gas density. Yeah. Like in Milky Way. Or you know, versus gas luminosity, luminosity but this is, the law, or this is the standard integrated Kennecott-Schmidt law. So it looks just like regular star formation. It falls on the correlation generally. Yes. Yeah. Um, most everything falls on this relationship unless you get some sort of, uh, if you have serious AGN dust heating, then this bit will go way, will go up here, right? Um, I don't know if we've ever seen many galaxies down in here where they have lots of gas and they aren't forming stars. Um, what about the Himiko? Well, Himiko it ha does not have a molecular gas detection yet. Doesn't have. This is, by the way, this is an empirical relationship. There's no interpretation here. This is Fraunfred luminosity versus CO luminosity. So you can interpret it any way you like. It's just measured quantities. But Himiko has not been detected in CO. It's funny stars, but it's down about. Well, Tamiko is about a ten. Uh, it's about 100 solar masses per year, I think. Or tens of solar masses per year. Uh, there's a there's a couple of them out there. Um, so that would put it in this regime here, sort of ultra luminous to luminous infrared galaxies. So uh, those are still beyond the reach of any searches for CO. I assume somebody has looked. Probably they have time with Alma. But we've been actually focusing on the carbon-2 line in that source and the other one, Ioka A or whatever it's called. Ioka, I don't know. Um, this is a ton of supernovas. Yeah. They all go off at the same time, right? I mean, if you're saying this can only form stars at this rate for like 10 million years. Yeah. So the supernova are going pop up. So they all go boom. We certainly see what we see the radio continual emission, which is related to the supernova, but not particularly the integrated emission from supernovae, but from or supernova remnants, but from the sum of all the relativistic electrons that have been accelerated and then propagate into the interstellar medium. That, that's standard thing. But in this case, it's possible that maybe you can see lots of things popping off. Um, going on continuously, more or less, at this point. Yeah, well, you see that in what would you see? You see that in some UERs, like ARP 299, is that? ARP 299. Right? There's a bunch of radio continuum sources that are all these really young supernovae going they go off. Up and down. They go up and down. Yeah, they, yeah. Are, they come and go. Yeah. You but see that? A bunch of them all in the same. But that's yeah, that's a nearby system. Would you see? It? You wouldn't see individual supernovae at this redshift. How about this? Or supernova remnants. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what I said. I think that the the if you go back to like I don't know the Villeneuve type models. Yes. Um, I think their claim was the maximum velocity you get from those is about 300 kilometers a second. Even in the most extreme systems. Well, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is is there were these two cases so far at these redshifts about there's there's more, but not many more. Oh, 
uh, where in this case you have a wing with it's only 300 kilometers a second or 300 solar masses per year. I'm sorry, I'm using. Actually, it turns out it's the same anyway. Um, you really can't drive a wind faster than a few hundred kilometers a second by supernovae. And if you want to get something that's 3,000 kilometers a second wide, the, the argument is it has to be an AGN. And that's in the Mytilino paper. Sorry, I maybe misunderstood something. But su young supernovae can have really broad wings, maybe not at those luminosities. Sure, but he's asking about sort of outflow from the whole galaxy, the, the sum total. But the different heavy energy into the molecular gas and then drive that, all of that reservoir of gas out. So right, and my understanding is a couple, few hundred kilometers a second is the most you get out of those, even in like Mark Herring 231 or Arc 220, something like that. Well, I guess if there's no more questions. Minus, um, you talked about the fact that these high redshift systems have very high densities, so they look like these molecular star forming cores. Yeah. Uh, what was the extent of that gas? I think I missed it. In most cases, we see it at the scale of about three kiloparsecs. It's big. It's big. It's like some millimeter galaxies show a similar thing. Not quite. Some millimeter galaxies, the overall excitation is lower. And quasars. Right, but don't we expect there also to be lower excitation gas there as well? Mm -hmm. It's just that we may not. It certainly is not dominating the luminosity. Mm -hmm. uh, it could potentially dominate the mass, and you still might not see it. Um, where's the excitation plot here? Now, we do have a few systems in which we have measurements of low order transitions, 2 to 1 and 1 to 0. Um, and those are all showing a very high excitation gas for the quasar host galaxies. So there's not a tremendous low, ma low excitation gas reservoir. In fact, Dominic Research has a paper on this where the title of it is No Low Excitation Cold Gas Massive Reservoir in Quasar Host Galaxies at High Redshift. So the answer is no, according to Dominic. Well, some millimeter galaxies do have them. Yeah, exactly. You know, because I'm thinking, can you just have all that gas and all be at high excitation? Or wouldn't you expect there to be more gas that maybe we just can't see? But I haven't well, we're not seeing it. <laughs> I mean, the only way we could miss it is if it was really big and diffuse and, and you know, low, very low surface brightness so that we just don't pick it up. But I think our observations have been good enough to we would have seen that. It's not a significant lack of mass there. Uh, yes, I think that's a conclusion that, that Dominic would say. Is that size scale of a few kiloparsecs what you would expect the size of a, a big massive galaxy to be at those redshifts? Do we know that? <coughs> or, well, actually some of these, there are really massive galaxies, a redshift of two of these, uh, what are they called now? Compact, compact red, red galaxies, yeah. I think they're called that are just red and dead, and they're very compact. And it may explain why it's so hard to, um, to see the host galaxies of quasars, because they, they also may have a, a, a radial extent, or a, what do you call it, um, size scale of about a couple of kiloparsecs. You won't see it underneath the PSF of the quasar. So it's not unusual. Right, and the other thing is I think the mass, you could work it out, I think the mass density in like grams per centimeter cubed in these systems is not that different than what you see, let's say, down in the inner few kiloparsecs of M87, or giant elliptical galaxies. But in that case, it's all stars. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I, it, I didn't, I didn't, you've got this quasar that's buried under this mountain of molecular gas and, and dust. And yet you still have it shining, but uh, but you know it was selected as an optically blue quasar from Sloan. That's why we looked at it. So there's a strong selection bias, right? We looked at it because it was so. This source in particular happened to conspire to do that. Um, are there lots of them lurking out there that? Be, but we missed because we're selecting in the wrong way. So I, I'm 
I do uh, remember that uh, metal poor populations produce typically silicate dust. Of course, these are not necessarily going to be metal poor populations. What are the precise conditions under which silicate dust is produced? Uh, I thought it was silicate and amorphous carbonaceous dust grains occur in the higher velocity type shocks in supernova remnants, that kind of environment, as opposed to the cooler winds from AGB stars where you get um, graphite. Um, I see. So, you, I see. so the, the statement about silicates, it's, it's, it's in comparison to graphite and not minerals. Yeah, that's the comparisons I've read. I'm no expert in this, but this is what people claim. And uh, you know, they, they do show plots where they don't see that 2,000 angstrom bump, which may be a, car, uh, a, 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 uh, a uh, crystalline carbon feature, they think. So um, that, so far as the evidence in some gamma ray bursts at Richf6 and in quasars, where they see a different extinction, so different kinds of dust. It's an interesting question, though. No, oh, you guys are still at it. Well, we've been, we've been discussing the M-sigma relation. Ah. Um, in particular, I think if, if you start with the galaxy you do have that have an anomalously heavy black hole or an anomalously light stellar population. Yes. And you only merge them with gas-poor things, all of which land on the M-sigma relation then by the time you double the black hole mass, you're basically back to the m sigma relation. Because you brought in a complete, you know, the yeah. initial stellar mass is nothing. You brought in all new stellar mass and gas core mergers. And the track that that takes looks like basically a horizontal line from, you know, up in that left corner, straight on over. And you had a sample of something at Redshift 4 which is intermediate between the redshift 2 and the redshift 6. Yeah. If we look at that sample, would they be consistent with the horizontal march towards M sigma? Um, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I, this actually, these, these diamonds here apparently are from redshift 1.4 to 5. So, uh, but I don't think that people. How they beat the time? Yeah. How yeah. are these black holes? That's the question I want. That was one of the things I wanted to answer at this meeting. Is I, we just take it from the literature. Well, actually, we don't just take it from the literature. We go out and get the magnesium two lines and all that. But, but you, you can see, even if you even if you don't believe them by a factor of ten, it doesn't actually change the the right. picture very much. You can move them out to the ten to the nine yeah. solar mass line. That's and still yeah, still yeah, twenty percent of them maybe disappear. How good is oh, no. how good yeah. oh, not then you're really way off, aren't you? That how good is sigma because there is an inclination factor. In so that's one thing you could occur, which was the question to you, is if all of these were face-on disks, then you would be biased. Oh, God, what would you do? You'd be getting low velocity widths, and so it would be saying the galaxy is low mass. Low mass, but mm -hmm. then the, the And the fact that you actually see the blue quasar would suggest that they are all face-on disks. Right, but so, then you don't make the mass bigger. Yeah, that's what. Of the black holes. No, but he's talking about the galaxy. This I'm talking about sigma here. Oh, okay. So that is one way to get to get after this is if they were all face-on disks, then it would bias everything exactly like this. But then the, the question is, could you bias them enough, right? Yeah, you could talk to Lewis Ho about that. I'm sure Lewis has his opinion. Well, you can. If you, if you gain a factor of two in mass just from not doing an inclination correction. In mass of the galaxy. In mass of the galaxy. Yes. A substantial fraction of those objects will go in the M sigma relation. Maybe a third of them. Yeah, that's why, you know, like I said, it's, it's a method right now. It's not a proven result. And I think we will be able to get that information through imaging. Uh, I think we're going to use the carbon two line and not CO, but that's a sort of a detail. How about the magnesium line? Is there any more that can match those? Well, there, there, 
the, the worries was all the line because none of them are perfect, right? So the best thing would be that you, you obtain more than one mission line. Right now we're in the process of trying to improve the methods, but you know, some, some people claim that the magnesium 2 is, is quite good, and it is quite good, um, but it's sitting in, in a sea of iron emission, and you, depending on how you take away that iron emission, you, you could get a slightly different velocity width. And we know that there are some narrow components. How much of that do we need to correct for? Just for, for, informational, for informational purposes, magnesium 2 relationship is calibrated using something. Yeah, reverberation yeah. mapping. It depends on which one. No, not reverberation what? mapping. That's the entire thing that it's not. It's the only line we don't have reverberation maps for. So how do you calibrate it? Uh, you mean me? Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm not sure. I forget which one you're actually using for this, which for like you. But if you're using ours, then it's intercalibrated for a large sample of slowing quasars, high, high signal to noise data, both from H beta and carbon four. So it's intercalibrated. So it's a, you've taken some line widths. That could be seen both in H beta. You see, you, we've taken some sources where we could see both H beta and magnesium 2 at the same time. OK. And then somewhere you both see C4 and magnesium 2 at the same time, and then basically line it up there. And then it's just the zero point also. And th those other sources, so that's the first bootstrap. Well, now, where does the H beta relationship come from? That's the well, that comes, that's then calibrated or... Uh, that's calibrated from, using... From the reverberation mapping. Okay. So yeah, it's somehow... It, with the M sigma relation at zero rich. Well, just a slight offset, right? Yeah. You could also just take away that, so it would just... Isn't, it a, isn't it a factor of five? No, that's only because you were using the, the line dispersion. If you use the full attack maximum, it's, it's within 10, 20 percent, yeah. Yeah, but that's just... Why, why can you make an argument? I'm not trying to be antagonistic. No, I'm no, just okay. saying that the quantity <laughs> you choose to measure right. is the one that gives you the smallest offset. But there's no reason why. Well, no, no, we don't. We don't. The one that gives the smallest offset. No, you're saying it's a factor of five. I'm saying depending on which line width you use for the calibration, you'll get either a factor of about five or you get a factor that's about one. So it's just because there's no relationship between forward half max and sigma of the Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. sure. But actually, but sorry. the line profiles are not Gaussian, and the and the the line dispersion is the variable part of the line from mm -hmm. reverberation right. mapping, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And I just wanted so to. So there's a lot of voodoo. There, no, well, there's the voodoo. Not voodoo. It's just that you have to be careful which which fudge factor you use. Right, and but you choose the fudge factors after you've checked which ones work. There's no fundamental reason why you prefer one method over the other. The, so your no ultimate no. criterion is what gives you the, small, the best agreement. Okay, non-observers with a lot of questions. So I just wanted to make a point about sigma in terms of dynamics here. And, and that is, I don't necessarily know that you can relate sigma to the mass of the bulge in this case for those high redshift objects. Sigma, as you remember, you guys are talking about line widths and all that. That can also be, you can also broaden a line from collapse. And that is exactly what is happening here. You are assembling a galaxy. If you look at that sigma for those big old squares up towards 1,000 kilometers a second, you cannot tell me that's a galaxy. No, it's not a galaxy. It is, in fact, it could be a galaxy, but it's not a virialized galaxy, right? That would be a cluster size object, right? If it were virialized. So that sigma may be a sigma, it may be measured properly, and have absolutely nothing to do with the mass of the system. And yet, more with the fact that these things are still assembling. Does this make sense? Yeah, so I, so I just want people to be very cautious. But, yeah, but in our case, the signals are too low. But um, no, 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 no. Some of them are very much too high. Well, least. a few of them, but that. And that's some of them, maybe. We do have some gal measured on very different scales, right? In the local Absolutely. universe, you're looking at very close mm -hmm. into the nucleus using stellar mm -hmm. dynamics, these superposition mm -hmm. orbits and all this stuff. Right. Whereas in the well, that's a, this is a good you're point. You're looking at much larger scales. Well, the question is when they when you plot the m sigma relation, what does that sigma correspond to? Is that uh, is that the sigma for the the whole halo? Is that the sigma for the, 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 the just the bulge, the effective radius? And that's how what how big is that? Yes, as, as as some people are pointing out, yeah. those galaxies are like squares. This is a mushy or something. Question: What's the What should we do? Yeah, yeah, the round ones are clear. Yes. And I, I, we like sigma 
because the M sigma relation was discovered in local creation elliptical. Now that we want to broaden into all galaxies. It's to be bulge mass or halo mass or something right. like well, that. Well, or bulge mass or halo mass or total stellar mass. Like it, it, I think yeah. we've reached the point where at least I'm not sure what should I be plotting on the X. Right. I usually show a plot that's <coughs> bulge mass versus black yeah. hole mass. But Ron likes to plot it this way, and it's her work. So One thing that would be really fascinating is if uh, once you get actual stellar masses for the hosts, which I, I, I don't know how yeah. we do, uh, if we get actual stellar masses, whether this plot rapidly starts cleaning up, wouldn't, wouldn't shock me. Well, of course. I, mean, I think, yeah, I, I hope everybody is aware of that. This is preliminary work, right? And there's lots to be cleaned up. Um, but it could be interesting if you go the other way around. There's some of the things that I've been thinking about and actually trying and, and what we have for the high redshift galaxies, it's hard to get stellar populations for those. Uh, but then compare with what we see for the total mass for a lower redshift galaxies. Uh. Yeah, I think, you know, the dynamics of the gas will clean up very quickly, and we can tell whether it's in full or a rotating disk or whatever. And now we'll have very clear observational signatures, which will just immediately become obvious. The rotating disks do certain things. Um, and that will happen in the next three years with ALMA. Um, the stellar mass is a tough one because JWST, they claim every time we ask to do it, they say you can't do it. So we don't do it. Nature gives us a coronagraph for these things, so are there any known heavily obscured Richard 6 plus quasars? Well, we want to identify them as quasars, then, right? If they're heavily obscured, what do you well, mean? It could be, still be bright X ray sources. And Richard 6 in Chandra and XMM, then just. Yeah, two. radio galaxies, too. 5.2. So, but there are not that many radio galaxies that are. There are not a Richard 6, no, there's not. There's no luminous radio galaxies. Some of these are. Radio loud in what with respect to star formation, but not radio loud. There's a, there's a luminosity issue. If the my understanding of the of the story, if I'm right about my recollection of the story of the type two quasars, you find them up to a certain luminosity, right? They're not as luminous as the you don't find type two quasars that are as luminous as the most luminous quasars. I mean, if unification is true at some level, even if the obscure fraction is low, you know, at the highest luminosity, so there should be some if unification is true. If unification is true, but I think the point at where you sort of run out of unobscured things, I thought that was at higher luminosity than these sources. But so, what are the volumetric luminosities of those redshift six quasars? Oh, they're the they're the they're beasts, ten to the fourteen. These are Sloan redshift six quasars. These are the brightest bloody things in the universe. So actually, I mean, maybe it <laughs> comes in. Right, last question. No, it's just a <laughs> Regarding what, um, what the problem the x-axis, when Scott Tremaine visit, visited City, he said the true correlation is between the black hole mass and the depth of potential. And whatever is set, setting the depth of that potential, it, the black hole mass is going to correlate with it. So. So that would that would be halo mass essentially. I mean, that would be stellar density at the center. Of Could you use Wise to get a stellar mass of these redshifts? The near infrared data. Mid infrared. Mid infrared data, you mean? Mid infrared, but if you took. The quasar still dominates. The quasar is just too bright. The only hope you have is the quasar is completely obscure. Yeah, you could get a system where where you know, and, and they're probably out there. We just haven't really looked. We get those uh, at lower redshifts. Um, right. So now there's one submillimeter galaxy at redshift 6.3, but there's no evidence for a strong AGN in there. It's um, it's more of a typical submillimeter galaxy. So. Do you know, based on gas measurements, whether some of this gas could just be really, really optically thick? Yeah. Which gas? The molecular gas? Yeah. Well, as I said, so in, in uh, some cases we're getting high brightness. We're getting brightness surfaces of 25 Kelvin, which it can't be more than 30 Kelvin or whatever the physical temperature of the gas is, 40 Kelvin. So. Some of the galaxies. I was just wondering if, if it's just so dense that there's no chance of the, the X-rays. Oh, it is. Com you know, the gas that we see is probably Compton thick. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, this molecular gas would be Compton thick. The column density is going to be greater than 10 to the 22. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So maybe we're just lucky with these wretched six crates because they happen to be you know, having drilled a hole in all the dust and be turned toward us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that'll help you. Yeah, yeah. I'd read that six genre and X Men are effectively new stuff, so you should find them. The question is, can you identify them? So we, we, we're sort of piecing together with a bunch of collaborators just large. Right, so what, you, what would you not see? So if, if you had a hard X ray source, but you couldn't get an optical ID, and you're having a hard time getting a near infrared ID in standard sort of means. You could get it maybe with HST, but um, what would you do with that source? Yeah. <laughs> Spend <laughs> many times, many nights at tech taking garbage near infrared spectrum. And uh, seeing nothing, right? And yeah. see nothing. So why don't you just go to Alma and look for carbon too? If you have some inkling of where it might be. But so, if, so these are classic sources which we've been studying in the deep fields and now starting to study also in wide area fields. Mm -hmm. And the general characteristics are no optical counterpart, then a near infrared counterpart, and then depending on your choice, a bright and emitted infrared as well. And then some of, some of them either being directly detected in the X-rays or being detected in the X-ray stack. And so uh, we've been studying these sources in the standard for years now. And it's incredible incredibly hard because they could plausibly be at of 1 to 3. Yeah, yeah, you talked about this. At, uh, sure. And so the, the problem is, which one do you invest a night of tech time or a, a three nights of ELT time on to get a spectrum when you don't, you don't even know? How accurate are the redshifts that you, let's assume you have a photometric redshift. What is the delta Z, 0.3? Gotcha. I mean, the, 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 pho the photo Zs for these things um, fairly hopeless simply because you don't even have a good sense of where the break is that gives you the good photo Z. Might be worth a search. Like I said, you could search with Alma for the carbon 2 line over a fairly large redshift range relatively quickly. Sure, but if you, if you wrote an Alma proposal saying we have this unknown source, we have no idea what the redshift is, can we have an hour of Alma time to see if we pick up a line? Uh, you know, this is what we're. Uh, this is the way to go. I, I think that that uh, the, the, the tack has been conservative the first two rounds, no question about it. Hyper hyper conservative. Um, I think that will slowly change. And now that Pierre Cox is the director, I think that will change pretty quickly. Paragraphs quick. of propaganda at the end of the glory that will come to us. Oh yeah, you know, uh, there's a different <laughs> story that could be told, which is trying to get the redshifts for these uh, uh, redshift eight uh, dropouts. You know, and honestly, the best way to do it, I think, is through the carbon two line. But it's a we haven't been able to get the time. I agree, but so the the problem with a, with any given source, the odds that you're looking at the Lyman break uh, at the Balmer break as opposed to the Lyman break is vastly in favor of the lower redshift source. So for any given source, the odds that it's actually a higher redshift. Ah, uh, you need some other some other information that tells you that we really think this is the one. And there've been many sources where I thought this is the one. <laughs> And later, thinking about it more, doing you know, redoing the photos, he convinced myself that no, this is not worth you know, at, at the time, just the, the back of the envelope calculation, this is not worth the fifty thousand euros that it would cost effectively to point VLT at this thing. Can I ask one last question? Sorry about the. Emphasis. All right, last question. I'm just wondering, I don't how how oh, I took it lens, off. gravitational lensing affect things at all? Like, are these there's no evidence for lensing in these systems. There's no, there's no multiple imaging in the quasar or anything else. What? There's no evidence for lensing. There's no multiple imaging. There's no, uh, there's no evidence for strong lensing. Uh, uh, I could show you in 1148. There may be some uh, w not what you might call weak lensing or, or sort of a, a flux uh, boost by a factor of 50%, a factor of two maybe. 1148 in particular, there's a big elliptical galaxy about an arc minute away, and it may be amplified a little bit. But um, there's no there's no multiple imaging which you need to get you know the factors of 10 or something in terms of the luminosities. Have the to I shouldn't say amplified, magnified. Sorry. Just nomenclature, but whatever. Actually, it's not. It's 
Sorry, what? So uh, right now, there's no evidence for lensing in these systems. I'm just, I'm, I remember very little from a talk I heard about submillimeter galaxies, where now they're seeing with Alma that they are breaking up into multiple sources, and they now think that the, these very luminous submillimeter galaxies, at least some of the ones right. that are being presented in this talk, yeah. were actually being lensed. Yeah, all of those were. Those are the SPT sources, and they're all factors of a 10 brighter, more apparently luminous than the typical submillimeter galaxy. Those are, and those are all strongly lensed submillimeter galaxies, um, which you know we probably could have told you before they started the project, but whatever, that's the way it goes. Um, and they make pretty images, uh, but that's a that's a different piece completely. Uh, in this case, we don't see any evidence for lensing, because that was the first two, thing that people thought of: is that all these Sloan quasars or HF6 are lens because they're too bright, but. All right, very good, thank you.